great. So I'm just going to move that over there. Okay, so welcome to this session. We just do a quick round of introductions before we get started. So my name is Amanda Melville. Um, I am actually, I should need to stop sharing, otherwise you won't see my face. So. Um, I am a senior child protection advisor for UNHCR. And um, we'll just ask if Natalie, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Natalie McCauley and I'm the Chief of Child Protection for UNICEF Bangladesh. Great. So Natalie and I will be the, the Australian dream team in case you didn't know <laughs> our accents Sorry. Um, together with you on this session. Mm. Um, okay, great. So let me just share my screen again. I'm going to get Do we to have you. a translator for Australians? <laughs> so we have that available, Steve. You've got to sort that out. <laughs> it was it was too expensive. <laughs> Honey. No worries, mate. We couldn't afford all the beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now if I can just start the slide. Okay, great. Um, so Jessica, can I just confirm that everyone can see the slideshow now? Yes, they can. Great, thank you. Excellent. So I'm going to move this little, maybe I can get rid of that. No. Okay, so um, what is the objective of the session? So we're going to be looking again at what is the, how is the, the pandemic impacted on the situation of children deprived of liberty. We're going to identify concrete approaches to protect children uh, deprived of liberty during COVID and identify opportunities to use the pandemic to build back better. And this was a common theme from the previous session and we'll be um, with Natalie exploring again together in the context specifically of Bangladesh, um, how how UNICEF and the partners have been able to use the pandemic as an opportunity to really um, accelerate the investments around the reform um, of uh, children in conflict with the law. Okay, the agenda uh, will be, as we mentioned, really an introduction to the impact of children deprived of liberty um, and, and the impact of COVID. Uh, we'll be looking at the case study, as I mentioned, together with Natalie of the situation in Bangladesh. And again, we'll be doing some lovely small group work and, and plenary report back with some summary and conclusions. So that's it. Um, we will look at the number, we have about 30 of us today. So um, we'll probably have a few less Jamboards uh, than we, sorry, a few less uh, breakout rooms uh, than we initially said, but it'll be the same process that you've already seen. So I won't go through that in, 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 in detail. So in terms of the issue, just a few opening remarks from my side. So who are children deprived of liberty? It's very important to think, I mean, there's many ways to, many aspects to children deprived of liberty, but broadly speaking, we can talk about three categories. First, you have children who are in conflict with the law. And those are children who have um, committed or alleged to have committed some, some crime. Then you have the situation of children in immigration detention. And obviously that is a situation where children and, and sometimes their family are placed in detention because of immigration related um, offences. Um, and the last one is children detained without due, due process. So in many of the places where we work, we actually have the detention of children absolutely unrelated to, to any due legal process. Um, and so it's important for us to keep in mind that we do have that, that other category of children, those other categories. It's not just the traditional way we think about children in conflict with the law. Um, so what are key priorities? And this is the, unfortunately, and for, you can see the guidance, the technical note on COVID and children deprived of liberty, um, identify three priori key priorities for us to work to, together um, as a child protection community. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to deal with my screen. In terms of addressing and, and protecting children who are deprived of, of liberty and the key priorities that were identified in that um, guidance note that was developed back, I think in April even, first of all, was issuing a moratorium on new children entering detention facilities. The second priority was releasing all children who can be safely released. Yeah. And thirdly, is protecting yeah. the health and well-being of any children who must remain in detention. Uh, Hani, can I just ask you to mute all the participants? 
And just a reminder to everybody, if you could mute when you're not speaking. Thank you. Yeah, I've done that. Thanks. Great. So this is giving an, a, a quick overview of children deprived of, of liberty. Now I'm going to open up um, and really, if we can just give me a second, we'll stop sharing the screen. Great. And now we'll turn, after that overview, I want to turn to Natalie. And Natalie, can you ask, could you uh, explain to us how did COVID impact on the way in which the justice system functions for children in Bangladesh? Over to you, Natalie. Yeah, thanks. Um, look, I think uh, none of us were prepared for COVID, obviously, and uh, the justice system in Bangladesh for children was already strained beforehand. Um, unfortunately, the practice in Bangladesh has been centred mostly around institutionalisation. And I think once um, COVID started, this didn't really stop, actually. We had an increase of children going into institutions still um, in places of detention. The courts were all closed um, because of the lockdown. Um, and also we had a situation where probation officers in, in Bangladesh, probation officers are like um, social workers within the justice system. They're called probation officers. They also were unable to access the children and the legal aid um, people were also stopped. In the detention facilities themselves, they also weren't prepared. Um, they didn't, weren't prepared for virtual situations. They didn't have Zoom rooms or Skype rooms. Um, and they had, uh, and they're very far away from children's courts. So one of the pieces of legislation here is that you have to um, go to, physically go to a children's court to actually get released, put on bail or even have your trial. So that just wasn't possible in COVID. And we have a very large country, obviously, and the three detention facilities are a long way away um, from a lot of those children's courts. Um, and the access to the families was stopped. So the visits were also stopped um, at that time. So it was quite... Uh, a jarring event um, and uh, yeah it was very hard to to cope in those initial days because pretty much everything stopped but the flow of children to those detention facilities continued. Oh, muted. Sorry. Excellent thank you so much for that that sounds like a really challenging situation to deal with Natalie. Could you say a few words about how did you address this situation? How did you try to respond as UNICEF and the partners to address the challenges um, you, saw, you just articulated? Well, uh, immediately um, we started negotiations or started talking with um, the Supreme Court and, and we, had a, we have a committee on child rights with the Supreme Court here. So one of the advantages for us was is that we already had that relationship and I think that helped us um, going straight into this. We were able to call that um, committee. We were able to work with the Ministry of Social Welfare, who are uh, the ones that are actually looking after all of the detention facilities, including the safe homes for children in contact with the law. Um, and we were able to solicit some joint commitments on how we can move forward, um, some acknowledgements that children are at high risk there and that's not going to make the government look good. It's not going to make anyone, it's not going to be a positive result if any of the children get sick. Um, they also had to recognise that most of the detention facilities had three or four times the amount of children um, that they had the capacity for uh, and that children were still flowing into the system. So we had to get that acknowledgement of the government partners first, but also we had to get the Supreme Court on board that advocacy started from the start. And I have to say also the Alliance document um, that you noted at the start of this session was pivotal for us because it actually was a foundational document in which we could start even broader discussions. This is, you know, this is a global document. This is a this is based on the global minimum standards. This is what we should be doing here. And so we were able to start those discussions and, and um, we were able to do it very, very quickly. We got an agreement that this was the way we needed to go, which was getting children out of detention. We started a negotiation to establish virtual courts um, and UNICEF um, supplied everything for the virtual courts. So we actually did all of the support um, in establishing those virtual courts within that first month 
um, of the COVID lockdown. So by April, we already had the virtual courts up and running and we managed to get um, agreement at the highest level. And then the Honourable President of Bangladesh issued an ordinance to ensure that those virtual courts were legalised. Um, the first session of the virtual courts wasn't until the first week of May, um, but it's still compared to, um, I mean, we've both been working in this field for 20 plus years. I mean, to have something shift so dramatically um, in such a short period of time is, is somewhat of a miracle in justice for children. So even, even in the last six months, we've had over a thousand children released from detention because of those initial advocacy. Um, and what we did notice though, that there was neglect the links to the probation officers and the social welfare systems weren't necessarily there. We have had to increase that. Um, alongside this, we were increasing the number of social workers anyway with the Ministry of Social Welfare. So this sort of went in parallel. So it was a systems-based approach and this was one component of it. Excellent, thanks. Now, it was really interesting to hear the figures that you talked about about the number of children released. Um, yes. since COVID. What was the rate that was being, is it, how did that compare to what was happening before COVID? Could you say a few yeah, words about they that? Weren't, they weren't really being released. <laughs> I mean, there was probably a few a month um, and, and you would get more going in, which is why they had three times the amount. So now they're at capacity, the detention facilities. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do. We need more commitment on diversion. We have that. The government is very supportive. So we've been so lucky to have great government counterparts that have been so supportive in this process, really committed to improving the rights of children. And even now the standards of children in these facilities, they recognise that the facilities are not up to standard at all. Um, not that we want children in detention at all, but we also need them to be safe when they are there. And there has been a number of incidences in the last few months that have identified that perhaps they're not necessarily safe in those facilities and it's a lot better for them to be at home. Great. So you've identified a number of remaining challenges that you have in Bangladesh and that the mm. Bangladesh is, you're working together with the authorities and partners in Bangladesh. Could you say a few words about how you're, you know, going forward, you're planning to address those challenges in support of the authorities? Well, in the last month, one of the biggest challenges we've had is that because things have started to open up and the courts have started to open up, there's been a reluctance to use the virtual court structure. So there's going to be an ongoing advocacy for that because we don't want children to have to go um, to another part of the country to be in front of a judge to have their rights assured. So the virtual system we want to keep because that also expedites everything that's going on. Um, there's also a need to strengthen the skills and the capacity of the judges and the lawyers and the social services, as well as the police regarding um, virtual know-how, but also the rights of these children um, to promote diversion. Uh, one of the things we were able to do within that first month was to train all of the judges across the children's courts, something that you wouldn't do usually and it wouldn't be done very quickly, but because of the virtual opportunities, we were able to do that. So I think if we can continue to leverage that technology technology advancement, um, I think we will all be in a much better place moving forward. There's a lot of um, creative ways that you can engage very high level individuals because you don't actually have to visit them face to face. So it's allowed us to have those relationships. Um, I think also we need to continue with our legislation. The legislation we have is from 2013 and the rules associated with it have not been budgeted for, they, don't, they haven't been costed and they're not being implemented. And that has been a large gap. Um, and the rules are not just for justice for children, but also for um, children at risk of harm and, and violence against children and other areas associated with child protection. And we need to continue that upstream work. What I realise, though, is that the upstream work that sometimes is not seen much, you know, you don't see the results. It's a slow, it's a slow working machine. Um, enabled us to move so quickly in those first six weeks. If we did not have the relationship that we did at the highest levels, especially the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court, I don't think we would have been able to do what we've done. Great. Well, thank you very much. I see a question, another question, and I think oh. we do have a few minutes. So if colleagues would like to post questions to Natalie um, in in the the chat box. So were, when I see a question here, were the virtual courts established by UNICEF used for adult cases as well? Um, no, only child cases, yep. 
only for children's courts and for children that were in safe homes. Um, but UNDP, after we established the virtual courts and we got the advocacy and the Prime Minister um, cleared the virtual courts, UNDP supported the adult court system having virtual courts. So adults were also released throughout this process as well. Okay, great. Another question I see from Alex. Have you seen more lenient sentencing with virtual courts than face-to-face -face, or were they simply far less courts than before? Well, a lot of the cases still are suspended. So it was mostly getting children out on bail or those that perhaps were on petty crimes to get the cases um, removed or reduced. So yeah, I guess in, in that case, yes, because the whole purpose of it was to get children out of detention. So yes, but not, not really in essence, it's still the same. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I see another question from Frida. Um, virtual courts have been leg uh, legalized by the president. Uh, what would be the reason why the traditional courts would like to go back to face to face for children? Um, because that's just what they're used to. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, they're, they're, these are very senior judges. Um, it was quite an interesting process where they'd be calling us at all hours on how to use Zoom, um, how to use the laptops, you know, how to plug things in and get things moving, how to scan documents, those sorts of things that so that they could still abide by the law and still work, use virtual um, courts. So it's still a learning process and um, some of them are fine with it, some of them are not. So we, we have to just keep advocating. And I, I think, you know, eventually it will be something that they just use normally. Yeah. Mm. They are, however, though, allowing kids to stay at the detention facility and access the court virtually, but the judge is just in session. Okay. Very yeah. interesting. Another yeah. question. How did you deal with the issues of confidentiality, security, child-friendly legal aid, record keeping, etc.? Yeah, so there was a whole process that was developed with the Supreme Court justices, um, and this included scanning of documents, um, secure uh, lines of communication, um, and courier services with, with some of the documents, but mostly it was over scan situation. Um, and they we had IT people work out um, how to do the security on the actual virtual court itself. Okay, great. Um, and I think a last question, does the virtual court also apply to a Rohingya refugee camp or do you know the situation of Rohingya children in conflict with the law? Okay, so in the refugee camp, they don't actually have a formalised legal process, although they're meant to be under Bangladeshi law. So, but the camp coordinators um, are the ones that usually end up deciding what to do in a case, which we're also trying to advocate for uh, a, a different system, because particularly for violence against women and children, they minimise and um, there's, a, there's an issue there for us, obviously. Um, yep. But there were a lot of children from the Rohingya camps that have come in conflict with the law or contact with the law, some in the safe homes, um, outside of the camps in Cox Bazaar district itself. Um, and they were they were part of this virtual system and a number of them have been now back home with their families in the camps. Okay, great. I mean, we do see that it's really important to, to advocate for, for equal access to yeah. these kind of core child protection services, including exactly. for refugees. So it's great to see that you're working together with the authorities to make progress in that area. Very yeah, important. Yeah, and we have good partnership with UNHCR here and, and, and they've been very supportive of this process too. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Well, look, that was really fascinating, Natalie. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to launch a Mentimeter. Um, so if I can just ask, uh, if I can just ask- We all ask, love Mentimeters now. We love Mentimeters, <laughs> right? This is the new way. Um, so if I can just ask, Jessica's just put the Mentimeter in, in the chat box. If everybody could just go to the, the link to get the question. So we'll just take a moment to allow everyone. I was supposed to do it before, but I forgot. Sorry. It's okay. I was so well behaved. I did really quickly. <laughs> yeah, people can still hear you, you know. <laughs> I know. But it's like we're having a chat. Like a chat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we can just, uh, Jessica, how are we going in terms of responses on the Mentimeter? Not very many. Only three oh, people. Come on. Come on, team. I'm going to start calling out names of people. Cool. So they're coming in. 
at this. Yeah, it's going up. Yeah, they don't want to be named. <laughs> Okay, we we'll just give it a few minutes. Um, of course, while we're doing that, we can also, if there's any last questions to Natalie or to myself, feel free to pop those in the chat. We'll we'll take them while people are completing the 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 Mentimeter. I did actually have one question myself, Natalie. You mentioned yeah. briefly the issue of um, of diversion. Could you say a yeah. few more words about diversion in the context of 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 uh, Bangladesh? Well, we've seen it as an opportunity to promote diversion because um, the police don't know what to do with these kids because the probation officers aren't in a lot of the police stations at the moment um, and they don't want to be sending them to detention facilities. So we've seen that as a, another opportunity to advocate for diversion more broadly. We've developed a guideline um, and we've started training um, police officers and we've been sending messages down to the police stations. Um, we've got support for children and women help desks. Um, that was part of the 2013 legislation but again because of the rules it hasn't really been rolled out and the funding obviously hasn't been there but we've got a lot more support on this and other agencies are also supporting this like UN Women, um, UNFPA and other INGOs like Save and Plan as well so I think you know I think we're moving in the right direction but um, for me, prevention is the best in, in all child protection. So early intervention, increasing social workers, making sure casework is there for these families. The kids that are getting arrested are getting arrested for um, things because associated with um, socioeconomic issues or violence at home, not having access to school. So those things can be um, worked out in case management, can be workflowed, can be prevented. Um, and with diversion, we can prevent it at another level because these families can be identified. Great. Thank you very much. So now I want to ask, yes, in fact, I didn't even have to ask. It seems that Jessica read my mind. Thanks, yeah. Jessica. So um, are you able to make that a little bit? Ah, oh, perfect. Okay. So now... Uh, I have the glasses on. Yeah, it's a little small. Um, I'm going to have to try to remember. So the first question is, how, how has COVID affected... Um, what are the three most important negative effects of COVID? So um, basically, mm -hmm. it seems the biggest one is delays in judicial proceedings, um, yeah. such as longer times. So that seems to be one. Uh, and oh, and I'm violence sorry. against and violence against sorry. children was the sorry. second one. Increase in violence. Increase in violence in all of the countries. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so we've seen those two are key elements. And, and then the pink one, you can see I'm really trying to read. Increase in children in conflict with the law due yeah. to the yeah. lack of um, in children being locked out, uh, uh, not able to access school or increase in, in economic issues. And then after that, we have number six, which is increase in children in, in contact with the law due to COVID testing regulations. Mm. Oh, no, sorry, number nine. Uh, that one, sorry. Deterioration. Yeah, deterioration of children in detention. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's what we see as some of the negative impacts. Can we move to the next question, which is more about the positive opportunities? So, um, so do P Jessica, can you just explain, do people have to go back and, and go to the, sec the same link and they'll go to the second question? Exactly, so that same link and then it should be on the second question then. Okay, great. So we'll just wait a moment for the second question. So I think, you know, what, it, what is interesting about this is we see mega, many negative effects, but also as, as um, Natalie and our other colleagues were highlighting, uh, we see many opportunities to be able to address some of the challenges um, and opportunities uh, for very rapid and, and very structural reforms. So it's really quite a, a mixed bag, but really a, the, we see this window of opportunity if we're able to mobilize the right political will as well as the resources to be able to make a, a huge change in the lives of these children. 
So we see basically here the release of children. Um, yes, in terms of this is also one of the things I think we see it came up in your presentation, Natalie, as well as a number of other colleagues' presentations, that in fact, governments are much more willing um, and authorities are much more willing to release uh, children from COVID because I assume, and what would be your, what from your experience, Natalie, what was the reason behind that willingness from the authorities? Because of risk. Well, one, because their staff weren't turning up, so they knew the children were at more risk, so there was less staff in the detention facilities. Um, but two, they were worried that there would be an outbreak of COVID and how that, you know, the aesthetics of that, how that would look. Um, I guess for us moving forward is how do we maximise that to for it to not just be about preventing infection rates of COVID? How do we maximise this to ensure that detention is a last resort, that this is not something that's a go-to option? Um, and that there are other options like diversion and like making sure that we have strong child protection systems and referral pathways at the community level. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Jessica, can I just ask you to put back the, the presentation, please? The Mentimeter results? Okay. So we see the second one is greater use of alternatives to detention. And that indeed was... was uh, is is really true. We've seen that in many countries um, around immigration detention that actually authorities are much more willing to look for alternatives to detention. And we heard that in also in your settings and the number of presentations before, as well as increased uh, political will to t address the reform of, of justice for children um, and greater attention to justice for children in the humanitarian response. I have to say in all my years, of working in, in humanitarian settings, I've never seen this issue be such high profile. So I think it's a real, yeah, really opportunity for us to really tackle this. And the last one that got a lot of votes is the, obviously the increased use and of technology to improve the accessibility and, mm -hmm. and um, accessibility and, and also the quality. And coming back to, I think something Marta mentioned in the previous session is really the importance of child participation, how bringing the justice system closer to children um, and their lives and making it more accessible really facilitates that child participation as well as the quality of the justice. So great. Thank you very much for that. What we're going to do now um, is really move towards uh, the, some small group discussion. So. Um, Jessica, I'm just going to remind people, we're going to, uh, we're going to ask pretty much the same question, which is basically what, uh, what recommendations should be made to strengthen the protection of children deprived of liberty by, um, affected by COVID? So Jessica, how many, how many groups are you going to put people into today now? Um, five, actually I might do four as a few have dropped yep. off. That would be great if you can pop people in four groups. And then um, basically as per the previous ones, if you can use the, if you can use the, um, the Jamboard. And then we'll also ask you actually, we'll share with you in the groups a Mentimeter where you can actually put your, your responses in Mentimeter so that they'll be screening when we come back into the group. So great if you could move everyone now. Thanks, Jessica. Right. Okay, we can, can, I mean, let's see how we have 10 more minutes. So maybe yeah. we can see if colleagues, we can, we can do the update and then continue to use the time in, in plenary because we're not so many, if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. Okay, great. There was a, there was a point about detention facilities that was just raised in our group. And I think it would be good to, to come back yeah. to that. Yeah, because I think I, I, I've got a suggestion for that, that may be a bit different to what they were thinking. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's, is everybody back uh, online? It looks Everyone like it. Back? Jessica? 25. Yeah, okay, excellent. So, Jessica. Yes, they are, sorry. Yeah. So, Natalie, if I can hand over you, to you to have a look and, and, and make some reflections on some of the recommendations that are coming up, is it possible to make that a little bigger, Jessica, because it's quite hard to read? I'm old now. I've got to wear glasses. Uh, if you make it full screen, I'm, it's everybody, if you make I, it full screen, it's actually easier. Yeah, I think that's the best way. Or I can just zoom in. If, does, does that work? Yeah. Yeah. And then I can move the bit around. 
Yeah, so same, Elisa, it's uh, Annalisa, sorry, it's the same uh, Mentimeter link as before if you want to add. So, uh, yeah, Jessica, oh, sorry, Jessica, I see <laughs> uh, your name on it. Uh, so, uh, Natalie, if you'd just be able to maybe read through some of the recommendations. Yeah, I can up. see here that there's, um, and when you had it on the bigger screen as well. So Jessica, it's okay because I've got my big screen here and my little screen here. If you could put it back on, on yeah, this. Perfect. Okay, so I can see that there was a couple of different ones that were talking about data analysis um, and looking at uh, children that are detained and what's the makeup of those children. I think that's a really important one, particularly in regards to looking at um, possible prevention um, options for us, but also divert them from the proper system. Um, there's also ensuring authorities do not use arbitrary um, procedures, um, making sure that we use the highest level of, of government to ensure pardons and that petty cases are expedited. Um, looking at individual case management, ensuring we increase individual case management, making sure we have strong relationships um, with uh, juvenile justice actors. Um, for us in Bangladesh, that has to be at the highest level. Um, working on adaptation of the justice system, um, COVID context with state actors and non-state actors, ensuring that, uh, oh, I already did that one. I already did that one. Okay, so it just keeps flowing up. That's lovely. So then if I miss <laughs> things, it comes back. We love the metameter. Yeah, so I think I think it's I think we're done, right? Did I get it? Sorry, I didn't get the way to stop it scrolling like that. It's just the way <laughs> it was. No problem. Yeah. Okay. So we're all learning. It's all a journey on learning how to do all of these kind of uh, things online. So I think that we actually have a few minutes. If colleagues would like to, from the different groups, we can just hear some um, some additional reflections or thoughts, and we'll basically take a take a moment to go around each of the groups. So let's so start with. Can I just raise something? Because something really critical in our in our session was coming up at the end, and he got cut off. Thomas, are you still there? Um, so Thomas works in South Sudan, and he was saying that his system um, of justice is obviously needs strengthening, like all of the systems. Um, and I imagine also virtual access was not really possible. But he said that one, they've only got one detention facility. Um, and how we can increase the detention facilities um, so that more kids can have access to detention, but I guess better facilities because one detention facility is overrun. Um, I guess we all know that obviously detention is a last resort and we want to promote diversion. That's, that's the way we want to go. So we want to increase um, the systems at the preventative side so we can increase diversion. But we also need to ensure that children are safe in, in these facilities. If you've only got one facility or two facilities and there's too many kids in there and they're not looking too good, you can start advocating for diversion and for community-based options. You can use that as a catalyst. Um, just like COVID, you can twist it to use it as a catalyst for saying, this is why detention is not going to work because we can't get money to help you to build another one. That's not an option. So let's, these are some options that have been done in other places. Let's get the kids out of here. Um, and that's definitely worked in other countries. Um, I know that it's definitely worked in the Philippines. It has certainly worked in Sudan in some locations and some parts of the Pacific it has worked as well in the past. But it's been a development approach rather than an emergency. Yeah. I don't know if Thomas wanted Thanks. to add to that. Yeah. I, I see Thomas here. Thomas, would you like to add? Uh, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, in South Sudan, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, from South Sudan IRC. Uh, in South Sudan, uh, there is uh, only one uh, juvenile center uh, that can uh, serve for uh, children or any uh, under 18 children. Uh, in most of the location out of that, uh, that center is in uh, the main uh, capital city in Juba. But uh, in the other locations uh, where uh, there are uh, children with, uh, in contact uh, with law, uh, they are detained together with the adults. There is no separate uh, space uh, to 
uh, accommodate them. So they uh, detain them together with the adults. Uh, there, there are so many uh, child protection issues uh, raised uh, even in those centers. Uh, so while we uh, strengthening or improving uh, this uh, the, uh, justice system for children, uh, we need to consider uh, the capacity building of uh, the local or the government or justice system. Uh, that, that would be uh, one of uh, my uh, points. The other one is at least uh, if, if uh, the government continue uh, detaining uh, those uh, children with, uh, in conflict with uh, law, uh, at least it's good to have a separate space uh, for those kind of uh, uh, situation. The other one is uh, there is no uh, child-friendly uh, court uh, system or so it's, it's also one of uh, the advocacy area that we uh, need to focus on. Yeah, these are some of my addition. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. I, I think that's a good idea, like focus on the capacity building at that local level and improving, improving the facilities there. Yeah. Excellent. So now if I can just ask uh, anybody else from any of the other groups would like to volunteer to add, we have about three minutes. Um, before we need to make some concluding wrap up uh, statements. Uh, I see can I a, just... Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, in our group, we were also discussing to think something about uh, building capacity of the juvenile justice uh, authorities. Uh, maybe it is not necessary that all the, the, the competent authority, they know about the children's right and different contexts, it is different ideas. So there is also need that, and uh, we are also speaking to to take this opportunity and speed up the the uh, reintegration process with linking them uh, children and community with some kinds of services like uh, maybe livelihood. And there is need of some kinds of awareness uh, awareness raising component. We can link with the the community, and uh, also uh, we have uh, this is also one opportunity we can. Uh, segregate the need of the children according to their age because the, they are in the uh, children the contact with law there may be different kinds of age there and their needs are different so this is also one good opportunity uh, if you can prioritize their their child protection need excellent thank you so much for those thoughts um, any other colleagues who would like to add and I'll just ask colleagues if there's anything that you feel that you discussed in your group that hasn't come up so far if you'd just be able to to put it uh, you know to add that anybody who would like to speak feel free to put up your hands open your mic hello 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 please hello. Nabil. Okay, this is Nabil uh, from Ethiopia, UNICEF. Please go uh, ahead, Nabil. Okay, uh, some of the things that uh, we discuss in our group is that uh, mentioned by, by my colleague, but uh, I want to capitalize the discussion that we had mainly on the focusing on the authority capacity building in order to release uh, children with different protection concerns. And this is what uh, we currently doing in Ethiopia. Uh, like there was a discussion uh, going on with the justice system at the federal, starting from federal level to the regional level, at least to release children uh, with having depression con concern, including uh, considering their age, uh, including pregnant girls, uh, those uh, who are a primary caregiver for their own uh, and other children, and at the same time, uh, who have also uh, suspected with a COVID-19 infection. And at the same time, uh, who have also that doesn't do I mean any serious uh, uh, law violation uh, in the systems. Excellent, thanks, Nabil, for those uh, those thoughts. And I just have we just have time for one more comment before we're going to have to wrap up. I've asked our our producer Jessica, our fabulous producer, to give us two more minutes. But is there anyone else who who wants to add from their perspective some of the key recommendations? Just thirty okay. seconds. Just to add, sorry, can I, uh, thanks Nabil. I just wanted to add that in our group, we also mentioned that maybe we need to document some of these good practices um, that have come up over the last few months. Because in the last in the last session, there was a number of really good practices. We've, a lot of examples have come up across different countries um, out of our groups today. So I, I, I'm just putting that out there as a recommendation. Maybe we need to document some of, some of the success stories on this area. Yeah, because it's so rare in emergencies, you know. 
Indeed, that's a great idea, Natalie, and we'll have to take that forward together with her, bring it into the discussions of the small groups yeah. <laughs> um, of the Alliance. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so now I think we'll we'll have to wrap up now. So I just want to give Natalie, if you could in like, you know, 30 seconds, highlight some of your key key concluding remarks. I know that, you know, it's always difficult because we've had such a rich discussion and I will try yeah. to do the same from my side. Over to you, Natalie. Look, I think thanks everyone for your contributions and I think even to the last session as well on Justice for Children and thanks Amanda also for leading um, both sessions. Look, I think it's, it's such an opportunity. Um, as we've both said, we haven't seen this much movement in this sector in emergencies before. Um, and I think we can capitalise on that. It is an opportunity. We have seen a lot of successes and it's about how do we take this now into a non-COVID world? How do we take this success and make it um, apply when COVID isn't such a big issue? How can we make sure kids aren't going into detention? How can we make sure kids have access to social workers and case workers? And how can we make sure that we prevent them from coming in contact with the law? I felt like that was them buzzing me out. Yeah, that was that was well timed. Hey, thank you, thank you, thanks, over. Natalie. Yeah, over, great. Um, so yeah, just from my side, I wanted to highlight maybe if we could just uh, put me on 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 screen, Jessica. I'm not sure if we we still see uh, Natalie on the screen, at least from my side. But just a few opportunities. Okay, great. So a few opportunities for reform that I think are really important that we've really see, for, seen from this. First of all, I mean, the digitization, as we've heard, the digitization has the opportunity to really improve the quality and the accessibility, but also the timeliness of, of justice for children and, and ensure that that is possibility. The, the increased use of alternatives to detention for children in conflict with the law and the increased alignment that we're seeing in terms of um, ensuring that, that detention is really a measure of last resort and diversion opportunities are really, really um, highlighted. Of course, I wanted to highlight as UNHCR, we are very keen and we're very happy to see many of, uh, I mean, quite a lot of movement also around the issue of immigration detention. Um, and the fact that we have seen more and more countries really moving to away from immigration detention for children. Obviously, uh, collectively as child protection actors, it's really important that we advocate and continue to support authorities to really um, move towards as fast as possible ending the use of immigration detention in general, but particularly for children. So we've been very pleased as UNHCR to see a number of states um, doing that. and. Um, and really, I think that we really see this as an opportunity to invest more in justice for children, um, to facilitate uh, the reform, sustainable reform of the system, um, and really to provide, uh, really to, to support this effort that we've been working on together to ensure that, that really we are able to limit to the absolute um, minimum, uh, the use of detention uh, for children in conflict with the law or for other reasons. Um, and so I'm going to just share, put up on the screen, we're about, oh, we're a few, quite a few minutes over, but I will put up on the screen, just remind all of you and put in the chat box that there are some great resources out there um, that you can refer to. And we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>